Our scripture for this morning's message comes from the Old Testament book, 1 Samuel, and uh, it comes from the second chapter, and we're just beginning to meet Samuel. There's a lot going on with the people of Israel, but we'll be reading yeah, chapter 2, verses 12 through 26, and I'm going to try to go, you know, give us a little bit of, give us a little bit of Spanish, although it's my high school Spanish. Um, so, let's listen to the Word of God. Now the sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know the Lord. The custom of the priests with the people was that when any man offered sacrifice, the priest servant would come while the meat was boiling with a three-pronged fork in his hand, and he would thrust it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. All that the fork brought up, the priest would take for himself. This is what they did at Shiloh to all the Israelites who came there. Moreover, before the fat was burned, the priest servant would come and say to the man who is sacrificing, Give meat for the priest to roast, for he will not accept boiled meat from you, but only raw. Okay. And if the man said to him, Let me burn the fat first, and then take as much as you wish, he would say, No, you must give it now, and if not, I will take it by force. Thus the sin of the young man was very great in the sight of the Lord, for the men treated the offering of the Lord with contempt. Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy clothed with a linen ephod. He had hoven Samuel ministrava en la presencia de Jehová, vestido de un, de un ephod de lino. And his mother used to make for him a little robe and take it to him each year when she went up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. Then Eli would bless um, Elkanah and his wife and say, May the Lord give you children by this woman for the petition she asked of, God, of the Lord. So then they would return to their home. Indeed, the Lord visited Hannah, and she conceived and bore three sons and two daughters, and the boy Samuel grew in the presence of the Lord. El joven Samuel crecía delante de Jehová. Now Eli was very old, and he kept hearing all that his sons were doing to all Israel, and how they lay with the women who were serving at the entrance to the tent of meeting. And he said to them, Why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil doings from all these people. No, my sons, it's no good report that I hear the people of God, the people of the Lord, spreading abroad. If someone sins against a man, God will mediate for him. But if someone sins against the Lord, who can intercede for him? That's a good question, and the sermon will be about that, I think. See, see, pick up, see... Si pecare, si, si pecare el hombre contra el hombre, los jueces le juzgarán, mas si alguno pecare contra Jehová, quien rogará por él. But they would not listen to the voice of their father, for it was the will of the Lord to put them to death. Now the boy Samuel continued to grow, both in stature and in favor with the Lord, and also with man. Y el joven Samuel iba creciendo, y era acepto delante de Dios, y delante de los hombres. Let us pray. Almighty God, by your Holy Spirit, speak to us through your word, and give life, give life to us through that word and through the preaching of Jim. And enable us, as we listen to the word, to learn from you who you really are, and not who we guess you are, or who we're afraid you are. 
or, or who we sentimentalize you to be, but help us to learn from the word to truly know you and to truly know your faithfulness to us in Christ. And we ask this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We may have a battery issue, we'll see. This morning we will return to the book of 1 Samuel and the story of Eli and his two sons. The episode begins with a theological comment on the character of the two sons from God's perspective. Verse 12, it says, Now the sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not long with the Lord. The word, the same word for worthless was used by Hannah when she, when Eli had accused her of being drunk, when she prayed and silently, had been praying silently before the Lord, only moving her lips. And she replied to Samuel and said, No, my Lord, I am a woman troubled in spirit. I have but neither I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for all along I have been speaking out of the great anxiety and vexation of my heart. <coughs> the Hebrew that's translated as worthless um, in the English Standard Version means wicked. A wicked woman, TEV translates it as a worthless woman. A New English Bible has degraded woman. So throughout the Old Testament, this Hebrew word for wicked is literally, literally Belial. Uh, in, in this passage, it's the sons of Belial, the sons of wickedness. In this verse, Eli accused Hannah of being a wicked woman because he thought she was drunk. Not just drunk, but doing what is evil in the Lord's sight in his very presence in the, before, at the entrance to the tabernacle. He thought she had come to worship Yahweh and was celebrating his blessings with a peace offering to the Lord. And then in the process, she got drunk with wine. But Hannah defends herself and states that she was not drunk. She had not even been drinking. Therefore, there is no truth in Eli's charge that she had been a bad and worthless woman. The writer of the book of Samuel now applies this same term to the sons of Eli. The charge is that they were worthless, wicked men. And the root cause of, for the charge is given. They did not know the Lord. In Judges, chapter 2, verse 10, soon after um, the generation of, of the Israelites who came over the Jordan with Joshua, most of them had died the scriptures make this comment about the people of Israel. The generation of people who lived after those who grew up in the wilderness and crossed over the Jordan River with Joshua to see the Lord give them the land of Canaan. In Judges 2.10, the scriptures say, And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers, and there arose another generation after them, who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. This generation were too young to have seen the mighty dirt deeds done by the Lord in Egypt and in the wilderness. They had not yet come to bow their hearts and lives before him to serve and obey him. They had no relationship of faith with the Lord Therefore, their hearts were given to doing wicked things and worshiping false idols. So this is a very serious charge to level at the sons of the Most High Priest of Yahweh who were serving in the tabernacle. They were responsible to teach people the observance of the law, 
to offer sacrifices to the Lord of hosts. After the death of Nadab and Abihu, sons of Aaron, who were offered on holy fire to the Lord and died in his presence in the wilderness, the Lord spoke to this to Aaron and said in Leviticus 10, verses 8 through 11. The Lord spoke to Aaron and say, saying, Do not drink wine or strong drink, you and or your sons with you, when you go into the tent of meeting, lest you die. You shall it shall be a statute forever throughout your generations. You are to distinguish between the holy and the common, between the unclean and the clean, and you are to teach the people of Israel all the statutes that the Lord has spoken to them by Moses. It was the responsibility of the priests to teach the people to obey the word of God. They were to teach people about sin, about the correct sacrifices to offer, and to teach the people to dedicate themselves to the Lord. They were not to allow any unclean person into his presence. They were to help the people to offer sacrifices for sin and offerings of thanksgiving so that the Lord might forgive their sins and bless them. In Leviticus 17, 5 and 6, it says this about the offering of sacrifices and peace offerings. To this, this is the, to the end that the people of Israel may bring their sacrifices that they sacrifice in the open field, that they may bring them to the Lord, to the priest at the entrance of the tent of meeting, and sacrifice them as sacrifices of peace offerings to the Lord. And the priest shall throw the blood on the altar of the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And he shall burn the fat for a pleasing aroma to the Lord. In Leviticus 7, 28 to 36, there are specific instructions for the priest to follow, make, to make these sacrifices and, 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 to, what, and to indicate what portion of the sacrifice belonged to the priest and how it should be divided. Beginning in verse 28. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the people of Israel saying, Whoever offers the sacrifice of his peace offerings to the Lord, shall bring his offering to the Lord with the sacrifice of his peace offerings. His own hands shall bring the Lord's food offerings. He shall bring the fat with the priest, with the breast, that the breast may be waved before the Lord as a wave offering. The priest shall burn the fat on the altar. But the breast shall be given to Aaron and his sons. The right thigh you shall give to the priest as a contribution from the, whole, the sacrifice of your peace offerings. Whoever among the sons of Aaron, Aaron who offers the blood of the sacrifice of the peace offerings and the fat shall have the right thigh for a portion. For the breast is to is waved, and the thigh that is contributed. I have taken from the people of Israel out of the sacrifices of their peace offerings and have given them to Aaron the priest and his sons as a perpetual due for the people of Israel. This is the portion of Aaron and of his sons from the Lord's food offerings from the day they were presented to serve as priests of the Lord. The Lord commanded this to be given to them by the people of Israel, and from the day that he anointed them, it is a perpetual due throughout their generations. By the time we come to the events of 1 Samuel, it appears that many of the initial commands in the books of the law regarding the offering of sacrifices were no longer carefully practiced. 
customary practice now seems to be the norm. The custom. The custom of the priest with the people was that when any man offered a sacrifice, the priest's servant would come while the meat was boiling with a three-pronged fork in his hand, and he would thrust it into the pan or kettle, the cauldron or pot. And all that the fork brought up out of the pot, he would take for himself. The custom of the priests. It had replaced the commandments of God for instruction to what they were doing. The priest servant would come while he, the meat was boiling. I've got batteries here. Okay. With the three-pronged fork in his hand, and he would thrust it into the pan or kettle, and whatever the fork brought up, the priest would take for himself. This is what they did at Shiloh to all the Israelites who came. Moreover, before the fat was burned, the priest's servant would come and say to the man who was sacrificing, Give meat for the priest to roast, for he will not accept boiled meat from you, but only raw. And if the man said to him, Let them burn the fat first, and then take as much as you wish, he would say, No, you must give it now. And if not, I will take it by force. In this, we see that the priests were violating the instructions given to them. The portion that they should have taken was the right thigh. A very prime and chief and, and really special portion set aside for them. But instead, they had developed a different way of selecting the meats selecting the raw and, and boiled meats, and then taking it for themselves to, for their own um, pleasure of, of enjoyment, to share in the sacrifice. But in the process of doing it, by taking it before the Lord's portion was set aside and the fat portion was taken to the altar to be burned, they were treating the Lord's offering with contempt. Two different ways they took that, their offering. The first one was that they, the, when the animals were killed for sacrifice, they, while they're still dividing up and butchering the animals, even while the, while the fat was still there, before it was cut away and set aside for the priest, and offered to be burned, they would come and demand a portion of raw meat for the priest to be taken off and be roasted. Then they also came after the animal had been sacrificed while portions of the offering were being boiled. These were portions that would normally only be for those who were offering the sacrifice and participating in the, in the um, peace offering. They took with their three-pronged fork and made and made and they could whatever they could stab they they take away from the pots. There is no mention in the text that they were careful to take away the breast as a way by offering, and there's no mention of the fact that they had taken the fat, separated it from the meat, and taken and, and offered that as a burnt offering on the altar of the Lord. Uh, a pleasing order and sacrifice to God. Instead, they treated the Lord's portion of fat offering with contempt. They demanded the priest's portion even first, um, even before the Lord's offering had been taken. And it's clear from the text of the two sons that the two sons of Eli, Phineas and Hophni, were responsible for what was happening. They showed blatant disrespect for Yahweh and his offering. To treat something as with contempt is to have the feeling that, some, that a person or something or so, is beneath consideration, worthless, deserving scorn. One shows contempt for his own job by doing it very badly, sloppily. One shows contempt for a person who's refusing 
to accept for a person by refusing to accept their authority or refusing to listen to their opinion. The priest showed contempt for the Lord by disregarding his portion and they sh that they should have may always made sure that it was offered correctly and first. This action displays an arrogant attempt for the wishes of Yahweh. 1 John 2 verses 3 to 6 says this about those who do not know the Lord. By this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly love for God is perfected. By this we, we may be sure that we are in him. Whoever abides in him ought to also walk in the way in which he walked. Again, in John chapter 8, verse 55, some of those who came and talked to Jesus in the temple, Jesus said to them, but you have not known him. I know him. If I were to say that I do not know him, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him, and I keep his word. I can remember an incident that happened when I was studying in college at Western Kentucky University. I often witnessed to my fellow students and a couple of other of the engineering, uh, electrical engineering technology students, and I found one named Jim who claimed that he knew the Lord and that he had Jesus as his personal savior. So I invited him and his girlfriend to, to Bible study with me only to discover that Jim had no interest in the Bible study. He never showed up. But Terry, she was very serious about her desire to study the scripture. And she began to learn and to grow in her understanding of what the scripture said. And pretty soon it became clear that Terry repented. She and Jim were living together. She moved out. But Jim, who claimed to know the Lord in advance, began looking for someone else to move in. The two sons of Eli did not know the Lord and had no regard for him, and they did not obey his word. Throughout the passage there, today, there is a sharp contrast between the sons of Eli and the boy Samuel. 1 Samuel 2.18, we, we now see that Samuel was young boy, and he was being trained to serve as a priest. He's growing up in the presence of the Lord. Beginning in verse 18. Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy clothed with a linen ephod, and his mother used to make for him a little robe and take it to him each year when she went up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. Then Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife and, and say, May the Lord give you children by this woman and the petition you asked of her, so they would return home. And we know that the Lord heeded the blessing of Eli, for he did indeed visit Hannah, and she conceived and bore three sons and two daughters. The young man, Samuel though, he grew up in the presence of Yahweh. It has to do with that Samuel is very aware of the fact he is there as a gift to God and his whole purpose of life is now to serve Yahweh. He's a young boy, young boy learning the ways of the Lord. This gives us a picture of Samuel's life as a child. He was Hannah's gift to the Lord and he knew his life was, so, was supposed to be dedicated to serving Yahweh. He was being trained in the temple complex in Shiloh under the instruction of Eli. And each year his mother faithfully was coming up for her annual trips to offer sacrifices. And each time she comes, she does not forget Samuel, but brings him a new ephod. You know, as the little boy is growing and the, the, 
the ephod is going up his le legs and getting shorter and shorter, she gets him a longer robe. She gets him a new robe, fitting for the size of, of what he needs. There seems to be um, considerable time that's passed since Samuel was first brought to Shiloh. If there were two years between each of, of Hannah's children, possibly as much as 13 or 14 years have passed from the time Samuel was given when he was born. I think there's a, a, that kind of a transition between the early part of this chapter and verse 22 where it continues and it says, Eli was very old and he kept hearing all that his sons were doing to all Israel and how they lay with the women who were serving at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And he said to them, why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil de dealings from all the people. No, my sons, it is not and no good report that I hear the people of the Lord spreading abroad. If someone sins against God, man, God will mediate for him. But if someone sins against the Lord, who can intercede for him? Apparently, the sinful behavior of Phineas and Hophni had been going on for some time. It's not a sudden recent thing they've done. When it, when it says, Eli kept hearing all that his sons were doing, it's indicating that this is a repeated thing that he's been going on. And it seems that Eli had heard many bad reports in the past and had not done anything to stop them. Possibly if they were over 30, maybe as much as 40 years old, Eli may not have felt he could stop them. Many parents feel this way about their rebellious children. It's hard to know the details of Eli's sin in this matter, but he is not without some guilt. As the, their father and as the head priest, it was his responsibility to be sure that the law of the Lord was practiced accurately and that all those who served as priests were carrying out the instructions of the Lord. If someone sins against him, he says, if someone sins against man, God will mediate for him. But if someone sins against the Lord, who can intercede for him? I, th I think Eli may be partly right. His sons were committing great sins against the Lord. But what he has did not have right is that all sins, whether they're against your fellow man or against God, they're ultimately all against God. And in both cases, there needs to be a mediator between us and the Almighty. In the Old Covenant, the high priest was that mediator for the people. He offers the sacrifices for the people so that they might be forgiven by God. And the law gives instructions that make restitution for those who have sinned against another person. Samuel should have been administrating the instructions of the law concerning reconciling the, the, his sons to make restitution to those whom they were wronging. Ultimately, both Eli and his sons need a mediator for their sins. There is no indication that either of them repented after they were confronted by someone for their sins. God has provided for us all a mediator. A mediator who serves as our high priest. God's provision in both is in both a sinless high priest who does not need to make sacrifices for his own sins. He has also provided an eternal sacrifice in the gift of his son who died on the cross. The eternal Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He lives forever 
to make intercession for us. He is our mediator between God and man. So we have this eternal hope in heaven at the right hand of the throne of God. Whenever we sin, we can come to the Lord and know that the sacrifice has already been offered. The priest is there mediating on our behalf. He knows our hearts and knows whether we have turning and repenting from our sins or whether we are flagrantly, arrogantly flaunting disrespect for God, putting God to the test. We say, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Paul says it to Timothy in 1 Timothy 2, 5 and 6. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. He gave himself as a ransom for us all. The final two verses of our passage today conclude with a fitting contrast between Eli's sons and Samuel. But Phinehas and Hophni would not listen to the voice of their father, for it was the will of the Lord to put them to death. And the, the, in concerning Samuel, it says, Now the young man sent Samuel continued to grow in both stature and favor with the Lord and also with man. Very interesting description of Samuel. Very similar to that which the scriptures put in the New Testament concerning Jesus. Growing in favor, growing, maturing in his physical stature, ability, and his, his size, his age, but also in his understanding of what God would desire from his life to please him, to serve him. And he also, because of this, he has great influence and, and growing in favor. We'll later find, as we study the, and get into the book more, that he will soon be called as a prophet, as one of the, la the last of the judges. In conclusion, what can we say? We can say this morning, we have an eternal high priest. He lives forever. He is the mediator of the eternal new covenant with God. He made the perfect sacrifice which washes away all of our sins. And we're going to celebrate this, that this covenant and that the washing away of our sins this morning as we share in communion. We know him if we obey his words and they, if we obey his words, it's evidence that we do know him and that we abide in him. So in conclusion, we can see that to know the Lord is a matter of the heart. One listens to the word of God and responds in faith. Then we come to know the Lord. The Lord of heaven and earth is a living God. He was and still is ruler over the nations. He sees the deeds of the people and hears our prayers. The Lord Jesus, our high priest, intercedes for us. He made the perfect sacrifice for us. His sinful, sinless life was paid the penalty for our sins and to atone for our sins and reconcile us to God. So if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He is the mediator of the new covenant in his blood. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do worship you this morning. You are holy. You are the almighty creator of heaven and earth. And you have created each one of us and call us by name. You seek out the lost, calling us out from the world, responding to the truth of the gospel. And Lord, you did not abandon us, but you sent your Holy Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, into this world 
to come, live under the law, perfect, sinless life, and die for us. And in this we confess that we are sinners. We are guilty in every way before you, but we confess our sin to you. We bow our hearts before you, and we ask for that forgiveness. We ask you to come and dwell in our hearts and our lives and to teach us to abide in you. Teach us to walk in obedience to the truth. Even as Jesus prayed that we might be sanctified in the truth. We do pray this, Lord, that you would have your way in our hearts and our lives this morning and uh, teach us to walk in the, the word according to the word of God that we might love and respect and obey you in every way. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.